Welcome to my fireside chat, a more intimate journey where we get under the surface and dig a little deeper into the issues and experiences that are both personal and professional that include many of my failures and some triumphs in there as well. Such as today's fireside chat, which is my first year in real estate, the hits and the misses. Thank you so much for joining me on this very, very first fireside chat. And, and as I described earlier, the fireside chat is my first year in real estate, the hits and the misses. And I'm just going to sit and partake in some of my experiences within my first year of real estate, some of which were really great things to do and some were epic fails. And I'm just going to go through my list and hopefully some of you out there will get something from it. Um, if you're new to my channel, uh, this is a channel for entrepreneurs with a heavy dose of real estate, so you may want to consider subscribing, and always feel free to let me know what you're thinking in the comments. All right, so let's get into our fireside chat today. My first year in real estate was epically scary. I was very afraid of leaving the career that I was in, which, which was the music business, and, and jumping into the complete unknown. And I want to start with probably the biggest hit on the list. So number one is hit. Ding, 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 ding. So shortly before I got my license, I was introduced to a book, a book that many of you will know. Uh, it's a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I'd never heard of it. I wasn't really in the kind of business world. I was in the, in the creative world. Somebody said, you should read this book cover to cover. And I did, and there is a chapter in there where it refers to burning one's boat at the shore. Now, what do I mean by that, Pete? So when I was, I was doing very well in music. I had lots and lots of hits under my belt. I, I, I had recent hits. I was a number one in 12 countries shortly before I got into real estate. But I had made the decision that I needed a career shift. And I knew that if I tried to do both jobs at the same time, I would fail. So I had to kiss goodbye to a career that I had loved for 15, 20 years and took an enormous leap of faith with no income into a, a new job. And I knew that I could keep doing music if I wanted on the side or I could do real estate on the side, but I knew if I did one of them on the side, they both would fail. So the biggest tip that I can give you, hit number one is burn your boat at the shore if you can, right? If you can literally end one career and start the next, great. If you can't, save up so you can do that. And if you can't do that, make, it, make a, a plan where you're putting enough of your income away so that one day you can literally put a cleaver between your two careers. Because I believe being a part-time real estate agent is, is incre it's an incredibly hard industry anyway, but to be a part-time real estate agent, many people were in the past. I just think with technology the way it is and the demands that are, that are imposed on all of us that you kind of got to be full-time. So that's hit number one. Okay, miss number one was, excuse me, miss number one was ignoring my inner voice. That's a, a bumper sticker there, Pete. Let me kind of unpack that for a minute. So when I was, a, I was at a company uh, where everything they taught me was very well-intentioned. Everything they, they suggested w w was probably for the good of me. Um, but I felt if everything that was suggested to me was very cookie cutter. And I, I remember speaking to my manager saying, you're, in, you're advising me to go door knocking. You're advising me to send postcards to a geographic area. You're advising me to do cold calls. What do you say to other people who are joining the industry? And she said, without missing a beat, well, we tell them exactly the same thing. So my thought process was, you know what? I kind of need to stand out. I need to have my own brand within a brand. And I wanted to, I didn't want to appeal to everyone all the time. I wanted to appeal to the people that I really got on with. And that was my creative world. But I did take their, the, uh, the advice I got to heart. And I did everything that I was told 
for six months. And I found, and I, I used to wear, and there's nothing wrong with wearing suits, but I, they suggested I wore a suit. They suggested I wore shoes. I hadn't worn shoes in years. I'd only worn sne sneakers. And I did everything that they told me. I had absolutely zero success. And I felt this yearning to be my true authentic self, which is something we talk about now all the time. But in 2005, that wasn't talked about anywhere near as much. And I remember coming home to my wife, Cindy, and I said, I am hating this. I said, I don't feel like a me. I feel like a fraud. I'm dressed up in a suit. That's really not me. I just want to wear, you know, my music business gear and my sneakers and my shorts and all of that stuff, which you could do in LA and you still can. And she gave me the glorious words of, just do what you want to do. And then the universe will take care of the rest. A light bulb came on. I became my true authentic self. And my client base, which was my sphere of influence at the time, could see that the lights came on, could see that I was enthused. I looked, I sounded like Peter. And the trust was already there because they were my friends. And then that is when my career began to blossom. So the miss was I didn't blend the two together. I didn't get the education and turn it into my flavor. I just took the ed education at face value. We have to get education. We've got to do it. We've got to learn. We've got to learn everything. But I took it at face value and I blended in. But when I put my spin on it, I stood out. And then I've never looked back from that day. Okay. I want to give you another hit. Here is another hit. Ding, ding, ding. Do anything to do with real estate, no matter how far it is from you within reason. So my recommendation is if somebody wants to lease a tool shed on the 101 freeway, I'm your guy. If I'm new in real estate, I want to get submerged in all the real estate um, knowledge and experience I can possibly in, I capture. And sometimes leasing a tool shed on the 101 might turn into buying a mansion in Beverly Hills. Not always, sometimes, in fact, very rarely. But I did anything and everything. I was showing people leases for $1,000. I just wanted to soak everything in. My first listing was actually 100 miles away, but I refused to give it away. I refused. My, my manager said, uh, you need to refer that out. And I said, not on your life. This is my first listing and I nurtured it. I worked with someone who was in that local market. We co-listed it, we sold it and it was great. You know, I got great experience from it and I did every little thing. People wanted to, I planned to hang out with my kids. My, my daughter was brand new in 2008. Somebody wanted to go see a lease in a loft downtown for $700 a month on a Sunday afternoon when I'd planned to go to the beach. You betcha, I went and I worked my tail off. I was obsessed. Every waking moment I was obsessed with how can I grow the, the, the branches in my tree of business? Because it just starts as, as an acorn. And all of these tiny little shoots of your first clients, ultimately now I've been in the business 15, 16, 17 years, I have great limbs of business that started from those first very shoots of an acorn. And, and so I say to you, if it's out of area and you don't know what you're doing, partner up with someone. If it's a huge luxury property and you don't know what you're doing, partner up. If you know what you're doing, kind of, go for it. If you're unsure, turn up at the property an hour er earlier that you're about to show, scope it out, and then write some notes. Go look at where the Starbucks are. That was a tip. Go look where the Starbucks are. Go look at where the new hip restaurants appear to be. And then go look where the parks are. Just drive around, do some research. People look for houses in the same areas. So if you don't know the area, go and scope it out. Maybe the day before. Um, and that really stood me in good stead. I did anything and everything for anyone. And that's where my business uh, originally came from. Okay. This is connected. This is a big miss. So I got, was very lucky. I got very busy. Uh, once I kind of became my true authentic self, I became very busy. And then I did a few of these and this is a big fat miss. So when I had, when I started getting a lot of clients, what I just told you to do a second ago, or what I suggested you do a second ago, which was do your research, scope out areas, you know, yada, yada, yada. I kind of stopped doing. I stopped doing and I caught myself turning up at properties, 
not knowing all of the details, sometimes, you know, not knowing exactly how many bedrooms and bathrooms there were, because I was just so busy that I would literally, Cindy would say, right, you're here at two o'clock, you're here at three o'clock, you're here at four o'clock. And I, there's no excuses. I had a new young family. I probably had my second child by then and my life was full. My life is full now, but um, there is no excuse for not doing your research. And I remember a client asking me, what school district a house was in? And I was like, God, I'm clueless. I don't know. I looked at the listing and it said CKW district. So I looked at my client and went, CKW district. And the other agent said, um, hey, numbnuts, that means check with district. And I had egg all over my face. I lost that client. And who knows how many more deals I could have done with them. They just thought I was tap dancing. You know, I've got this nice accent. Well, at least I think it's nice. And I'm, you know, big smile and full of confidence. But I didn't do my research. And I let that client down. And they quite rightly went off and worked with someone who did put the time in, who did know what CK uh, district meant. And, and I lost them. So that was a big lesson for me. Tap dancing, not allowed. Know your stuff inside and out. Know all the houses you're going to show, know the square footage, know the school districts, know everything. Scope the area, do your homework. Okay. Hit. Ding, ding, ding. This was a very, very smart decision. So I'm about to tell you something, not because I'm trying to impress you, but because I want to just share my journey. So if you want to dig back in history and go back into the 90s. I was a pretty successful dance music record producer. I, I'm saying this on here, not again, not to impress anyone, just to kind of put it in perspective. I had close to 50 number ones in the, in the, in the dance chart, the Billboard dance charts and the Music Week dance charts because I had a lot of hits before I moved to America. Um, so somewhere in between, you know, 40 and 50 number ones. When I joined my real estate brokerage, I'm in LA and everybody talks about entertainment all the time. Um, I decided to not mention anything to a soul. So the brokerage I was at, I just shuffled in the back. I sat down, I put my hand up as a new agent, I absorbed everything, I asked questions, I checked my ego at the door because I was on a one-way journey and that one-way journey was to success. It wasn't to feel good about myself. I didn't need to impress my new colleagues that I was a former hit record producer. I was just a new green guy with a freshly printed license and I was exactly the same as all of they once were, and I was there to learn. I wasn't there to show off. I wasn't there to beat my chest. I wasn't there to, to, to make them think, oh wow, what a successful guy. I was there to study, learn, and work. And I did the same with many of my clients, right? It's very tempting when you're working with people who are especially in entertainment, to go, hey, you know what? I was a record producer. And I remember telling a bunch of my clients after we closed, you know, because you're celebrating the pressures off, and they were like, oh God, I wish you'd told me. But because I didn't, because I was there to be of service and nothing else, I wasn't there to service my ego, I was there to be of service to my clients, you know, it really galvanized very, very strong bonds with, with my clients and agents alike. And I'm still known as a guy who, I'd like to think, I'm, I'm known as a guy who, you know, nobody ever goes, oh, Pete, what, I'm a huge ego. They'll be like, everybody goes, says, says this, oh, Pete, what a nice guy, always sharing his ideas. And again, I'm not saying this to impress you. I'm not trying to make you think how wonderful I am. I'm not. I'm here to try and partake some, some knowledge that's really helped me along the way. Okay. Massive, I'm going to do a big miss now, big fat miss. Again, I was given very good advice. I was given a listing presentation and I was told you need to do it like this. And the way I was taught was, it was paper back then, you were given paper, you have the people sit down with you at the kitchen table and you go over it page by page by page by page. And I was in the class and I studied and I learned it and I practiced at home. Every listing appointment I went on, I failed. This was after I'd been working with buyers pretty successfully. I was failing miserably at being a listing agent. And it's because once again, I took the advice at face value. I didn't do it in my style. 
I did it in their style and it didn't work for me. It just didn't work. So what I decided to do was kind of take the parts of the listing presentation, which in my case, I'm not recommending you do this. Everybody's got their own style. Some of the best listing agents in the world will sit there going through paperwork or, or a listing presentation. My thing was, I knew the numbers, I knew the streets, I knew the houses, I knew the bedroom count, I knew the comps, I knew them all in my mind. And I could, and I, I had it all in my iPad, right? But the way that I like to do a listing presentation is I like to look people in the eye. I like to discuss their needs. I like to discuss their wants. I like to discuss their journey. Where are they gonna go? Are they moving out of town? How many kids? Is it school district? You know, I like to really kind of get in there as an advocate, not just as a vendor. And that for me was where everything changed. And from that day, I still do my listing presentations in the same way. I sit down with people, I talk about the numbers, I talk about staging, I talk about photography, videography, social media, and then I will show them a few things too. But the showing for me comes right at the end and not at the beginning. So the advice here is do it your way. Practice with a family member, practice with your brother, your sister, your spouse, your mom, your dad you know, as if they're a client and say to them, tell me what I'm doing right, tell me what I'm doing wrong. And you will find your rhythm. Once you get that rhythm, boom, you are full of confidence. You've got sizzle. People know, like, and trust you far quicker than if you're just staring at paper. Also, my theory is when you're just staring at paper, you kind of like everyone else because that's what everyone does. Okay, last but not least, in fact, this was crucial to my success as being a real estate agent, this is a big hit. Ding, 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 ding. Even in your first year in real estate, what I made a policy of was doing lots and lots of social media, just like I continue to do today. Here is the trick though, not trick, here is my, my recommendation. I do it as original content. I don't just like send out you know, these infographics and these stuff that are pre-made by the, by the various companies, that stuff's fine. But if you really wanna make an impact with your sphere of influence, people like you. So you are your own PR company. Social media allows us to get online and really bare our soul, really show people who we are, really kind of, you know, give it all away. And it allows people to make their judgment calls on our character, on, on what we like, what we dislike. I'm fine with people being very polarized politically, whatever, you like punk music, you like dance music, whatever. I, I, I'm, I, I'm a big believer in being polarized as long as it's legal and it doesn't hurt anyone. Um, because you're gonna attract, if I'm into golf, which I'm not, but if I was into golf I'm, and I talk passionately about golf, I'm gonna attract golfers. I'm passionate about house music, about electronic music, about raves, about cl the club scene. I don't go anymore, but I, it was, used to be my business, so I'm still very passionate about it. People can hear it in my voice and I attract an awful lot of creatives because of it. So have a robust, planned out social media strategy that you deploy every day single week. Plan it out months in advance. House tours can be part of it. Photographs at you in inspections, meeting clients, giving keys, you can figure it out. But just make it original and make it you. Don't make it vanilla. Just make it just awesome. So ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the conclusion of my very first fireside chat, uh, my first year in real estate. I hope some of you guys made it to the end. If you got to the end, um, give me three smileys and a thumbs up, then I'll know you got to the very end. And if you didn't get to the end, I'll never know. Feel free to leave your comments. And don't forget, if you haven't done so already, subscribe. And I would love it if you would forward this content to someone else that may benefit from it. And this is Pete Lorimer signing out for a very, from a very enjoyable fireside chat. I gotta tell you, I really enjoyed doing that and I'm gonna do one again very soon. And until then, I will see you later. Toodaloo.